tracking law enforcement's use of force was supposed to be transparent as of July, why we're still waiting two months later. Migrants from Venezuela just found out they will soon be eligible to get jobs. We look at how they've been managing on their own. How about we start with answering all the problems with Bridge Care? Bridge Care, the one-stop shop website for universal preschool, defends itself after getting put in timeout by state lawmakers. Everybody's palate is different, so the idea is to get more palates to the party. The Great American Beer Festival kicks off today in downtown Denver, and brewers of color are in the spotlight for the first time. Without the George Floyd protests in 2020, the death of Elijah McClain might not have received another look, which resulted in charges against two, uh, several Aurora police officers and paramedics. Today was the first day of testimony in the trial of two of the officers accused of contributing to McClain's death. Those same protests in 2020 led state lawmakers to pass sweeping police accountability reforms like requiring body cameras on all law enforcement. It also added transparency. The creation of an annual report and public dashboard on the use of force by law enforcement if the force resulted in death or serious injury. That report was supposed to be available July 1st, yet it is still not available. That report will include more than two dozen pieces of information like the type of use for, uh, force used, which law enforcement members were present by name, whether or not the officer unholstered their gun or fired it, the demographics of the person contacted by law enforcement, when and why they were stopped, and if the officer or deputy resigned while under investigation. A spokeswoman from the state's division of criminal justice said we don't have any of this yet because of unexpected technology challenges. More than 270 law enforcement agencies had to shift how they collect data to meet the needs of the dashboard. Former Democratic state representative, current Denver City Councilwoman Serena Gonzalez Gutierrez helped get the yet to be released dashboard into law and believes it will act almost as a workplace review for law enforcement. But it's also going to help our law enforcement officers. It's going to help them to be able to reflect and, and perhaps look at different ways um, that they can work with the public and with, work with the community at large. The report is now expected sometime this fall. It will only include incidents since August 2022. One legislative hearing is not going to be enough to unpack the problems lawmakers, parents, school districts, and preschool providers want solved with Universal Preschool. The portal that parents sign up through is provided by BridgeCare, the company the state contracted with. That company got name dropped several times Wednesday as lawmakers asked Universal Preschool leaders what's up with the problems they've been hearing about. I seem to have more uh, feedback about bridge care than any other uh, category. How about we start with answering all the problems with bridge care and what we're going to do now to fix that problem now, not a year from now. I spoke with the head of bridge care, the provider of the portal that parents use to sign up their kids and what the state uses to match students. She told me bridge care can explain how the website works, like the algorithm that matches students to providers. But the state is responsible for questions about who can access data from the site. The Department of Early Childhood promised a response this afternoon. It came about 45 minutes ago and did not really have anything substantive. Migrants from Venezuela who have settled in Denver will soon be able to work legally again. The city of Denver does not ask migrants their country of origin, but the mayor's office believes a vast majority of recent migrants from the southern border have come from Venezuela. Those migrants who have arrived here before July 31st will be granted temporary protected status, or TPS, by the Department of Homeland Security. The cutoff for TPS had been migrants who had arrived since 2021. Arturo Jimenez, a local immigration attorney, tells us allowing more migrants temporary protected status will streamline their way through the immigration system. TPS now allows folks who were in the immigration court system to apply for TPS and the judge can grant them TPS and move them out of our clogged up immigration court system. It, it saves taxpayer money. But the work permit is really the um, the, the ability for someone to actually receive a social security number, to work with an employer um, in a legal employee relationship, um, and it facilitates so many things, you know, opening bank accounts and, you know, enrolling your kids in school. 
TPS was also used to help Ukrainians after the country was invaded by Russia. The goal is to grant work permits within 30 days instead of 90. Venezuelan migrants who arrive here after July 31st are not eligible for this protection. And that announcement is good news for people from Venezuela that we have talked with, like Edith, who found an innovative way to make money despite not being able to find work. Here's our Angeline McCall. In a crowd of men competing for jobs, one woman is on her own, working. Edith came from Venezuela, bringing her own recipe of a traditional arepa. Ah, porque aquí están los mismos de nosotros, los venezolanos, y comen arepa. Four months ago, she arrived in Denver, hoping for work in a restaurant, store, or office. En la mañana, temprano, eso es rapidito. So many people here, all looking for so little work. Pollo y carne, lo que me queda. And for Evie, this is a start. Más seguro todo, porque sé que agarro el dinero de una vez y no tengo que estar esperando que me que me paguen, que me paguen, que me paguen. We met her two different mornings. Que hay mana. Selling one arepa and a cafecito for five dollars. Yeah, bro. Porque yo se me empecé yo a ver y a ver y sí yo dije sí sí puedo trabajar aquí vendiendo mis arepas. Y donde yo vivo pues es es un poquito pequeño pero sí sí me presto para hacer mi mi trabajo. Money she needs for rent. No alcanza pagar con esto. Mi esposo y mi hija pagamos. Each day, she can plan on making at least $80. Something small now, she hopes to build into a business. Porque mi manera de gustar de yo trabajar así, para no trabajar a los demás, pues. Few who come here know beforehand if they'll find a job. By the time Evie arrives, she's already working. And back to that announcement from the Biden administration. They were saying, for instance, that one of the reasons migrants looking for work like this, you know, all cash, is because of that challenge to legally work when they arrive here in the United States. So that temporary protected status would apply to everyone looking for work, for those who came through a port of entry or if they did not come through a port of entry. So not only does that streamline their process, but it also gives them a lot more options for work because it opens up more employer options to not only those who are willing to pay them underneath the table in cash. I'm so impressed by this. Like, I think of, oh, I could do this as a side hustle, or the, like the, the innovativeness of, like, I'm going to go, I can't get the job, I'm going to create my own work and work for myself. This announcement doesn't necessarily, I mean, she could continue to do what she does, minus this announcement. But yeah. it's, it's good for her anyways. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this story, right, it shows just how creative and innovative people are. And it's not just once they get here to Denver. This is what they have been doing this entire time to get to the United States, stopping in towns, working, doing their own little thing. You know, a lot of people, uh, for instance, would try to take out, like, trash cans out of people's yards. Just stuff that, like, you know, an easy tip, right, or just easy money. Like, we say easy, but really it's not. My first date with my wife was over a rapist. Wow. Yeah. Do you remember what kind? Our next question comes from Aaron, who spotted this device and sign inside DIA a few weeks ago and wanted to know why the airport is monitoring sound, how long it's been doing it, and who's in charge of it. I believe it was chicken and beans. Uh, it turns out these devices are used to monitor construction noise levels in the terminal as part of that long, expensive remodeling of the Great Hall. So basically, they're permanent. The airport's been monitoring noise since the beginning of construction, which started five years ago. There are multiple devices, and the airport moves them around based on where the active construction is happening. As for a noise limit, a DIA spokesperson said the federal OSHA requirement is 90 decibels, so like a leaf blower, but the airport monitors at the general industry standard, which is 85 decibels, so like a blender. The airport's contractor is responsible for monitoring, but DIA has a team to make sure construction that gets close to those limits happens at night when fewer people are around. We are thrilled to protect Mount Democrat. It's been in the works about a year. Well, I hate to see the property taxes for the people who just bought part of a Colorado mountain. 
And brewers are breaking down boundaries in downtown Denver this weekend, bringing color to a predominantly white industry. Bird watchers at Bar Lake are all aflutter, wondering where their feathered friends will go when trees come down. That is Nest. Denver's biggest beer festival kicked off 42 minutes ago, and for the first time ever, the new National Black Brewers Association will have a block of booths at the event. Out of 10,000 breweries, fewer than 1% are black-owned. But brewers at GABF this year want that representation to change. Crowns and Hops Brewing is one of the first uh, black-owned, women-owned, and veteran-owned brewing companies. Uh, one of its co-owners, T.O. Hunter, is a board member of the National Black Brewers Association, which helps black and brown owned breweries get the capital they need to get started. There is a, um, a correction that needs to be made about how people talk about black people in beer as if it's new. There have always been people of color, black people in the beer industry, uh, in, the, in the actual uh, craftsmanship of beer. As the industry changes, the Boulder Based Brewers Association has been working on diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts for the last few years, offering grants to help smaller black owned businesses. This is the most Fort Collins thing I'm going to read today. Atmos Zero is working with Colorado State University to, de to develop new drop in electric heat pump systems, and they're piloting the technology at New Belgium Brewing, a brand that's already known in the state for its sustainability efforts. The heat pump, called the Boiler 2.0, is being built and tested at CSU Energy Institute's Powerhouse Energy Campus. The goal is to cut down on emissions by replacing traditional fossil fuel-powered boilers with the drop-in electric system, which reduces the brewery's carbon footprint by using decarbonized steam. Atmos Zero's goal is to eliminate steam-based carbon emissions completely. At New Belgium, steam makes up about 50% of their carbon emissions. Nationwide, low temp industrial heating was responsible for 7% of total emissions. Emissions is the word I'm trying to say. According to an energy innovation study, that's the same as 74 million gas powered cars. The CEO of Atmos Zero says decarbonized steam could be the solution. Steam drove the industrial revolution, and when you walk into a boiler room today, you find packaged drop-in products, combustion boilers. We are focused on bringing an electrified solution to that problem that is similarly a mass manufacturable drop-in product. We're focused on making industrial decarbonization a product, not a project. The goal is to be at net zero emissions by 2050 while keeping the technology cost effective. Atmos Zero and New Belgium are hoping to install the pilot project by the end of 2024 and hoping they can brew a decarbonized fat tire by 2025. Colorado hikers rejoice. A major access point to the Decalibron Loop is open to the public again after a nonprofit bought a huge chunk of Mount Democrat. They bought a mountain. The Conservation Fund announced it secured around 300 acres. Its previous owner, John Reber, has kept the route closed unless hikers sign waivers. That happened starting in March. That's when the Senate Judiciary Committee ruled that they wouldn't protect landowners from being sued under Colorado's recreational use statute if someone got hurt on the trail. The purchase opens access to Democrat and also Mount Cameron. The fund's Colorado project manager says it's a victory for, well, pretty much everybody who hikes there. The community is the winner, Colorado's recreational economy is the winner, the landowner in my talks with him feels like he's the winner, this is a solution for him, and so it's, it's wonderful that we're able to find this common solution and provide recreation access for the public. She says the organization plans to sell the land to the U.S. Forest, Forest Service by the end of the year. And hopefully we'll find out how much it costs. That's something I want to know. How much does a mountain cost? Danielle, what's your guess? Uh, 27 million. I can't tell you if you're right or wrong. I, I don't know. We're okay. going to have to wait Marshall, till they say. get to the bottom of this, it, would you? I know we asked. They didn't say. And <laughs> I, I wasn't doing the interview. But I'm like, it's a, land sales have to be public records. I would think so. We're going to find out sooner or later. Marshall gets to the bottom of everything. So mm -hmm, he's coming for you.
Better believe it. It's about money. <laughs> hey, you know what? We had a great day. Whether you're hiking a 14er, you're hanging out down here in the metro area, you were treated to some blue skies. A couple of clouds out there in the distance, otherwise fantastic. We are going to be looking at uh, temperatures this afternoon in the 80s for the metro area, 90s out there in Ray and Lamar, 60s, 70s to the high country. We have been monitoring some severe storms, tornado watch impacting Nebraska and Kansas tonight around the metro area, though. No severe weather to speak of. As we look ahead toward tomorrow morning, a few isolated showers around I-7. Otherwise, those clear out. We're getting ready for a weak front uh, to push through. Here we are about 6 o'clock or so tomorrow. And then looking ahead, a couple of rain, snow showers around the northern uh, side of Colorado. As this storm system rolls through, yes, it will bring us some cooler temperatures, but also pretty windy. South central Colorado looking at a red flag warning. Tomorrow, daytime highs back to the 80s we go. Should be another uh, fantastic final day of the summer season. And then your seven-day forecast. A little cool, feeling more like fall for the weekend. We really know that there are sensitive areas of Bar Lake. You know, Bar Lake is known for our birding. We've had over 371 different bird species sighted here. Bird watchers are watching, but this time they're watching construction. How Bar Lake is working to preserve bird habitats. Nest. Bar Lake Park is making waves with residents who want to see the wings soar. The park is leased by Colorado Parks and Wildlife and is the headquarters for the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Now they're looking for answers as to why trees are disappearing from their shoreline. And this is a magical place. It's one of the top birding places in Colorado. Hi, my name is Tammy Vercotteren. I'm the executive director for Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. The whole reason we're here is we're part of the Central Flyway, a really critical migratory route. We're in the middle of fall migration. And right now, um, the Farmers Reservoir and Irrigation Company, commonly called FRICO, is working on mitigation. So this is looking north where the slope was too great and they did have to remove the vegetation. And with the added spring, as we all remember, a very cool and wet spring summer, um, that caused some issues and we were seeing some breaching of the dike. So that water levels put limits on things and dams and dikes that hadn't been there before. My name is Michelle Subert. I am the park manager at Bar Lake State Park. Our job as a park ranger and as the park manager at Bar Lake is to protect the resources, but also public safety. So when you talk about a dam, a dike that is having issues, then that's something that needs to be addressed. Where they need to do this work is right where our banding station is too. We also have bald eagles nesting here. They've been nesting here for over 35 years. They have a certain cutoff point that, you know, that we've identified and we've rocked the rest of it to kind of let them know that there are super sensitive areas to here that includes our banding station, the nature center, and the wildlife refuge. We walked the site with staff from FRICO and with Michelle, and we just got a better understanding of why they need to do this, how they're doing it, and then we engaged in conversations on how we could minimize the footprint. It's a constant relationship and building those partnerships with the irrigation company, with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, with other people in our agency and the Bird Conservancy. We'll continue to work with Colorado Parks and Wildlife and make sure our shared knowledge and technical expertise in conservation are coming to solutions for, for the work that they're doing. That was through the lens of Byron Reed. Your feedback, and if I can say emissions or brewery, coming up next. Bill's trying to get me to say emissions again. By definition, isn't steam just water vapor? Bill, I'm a journalist because I'm really bad at science. See you next time.